so I teach a lot of classes, and one of the first things I do in my class, oh, that might be necessary. <clears throat> yes. uh, so the, one of the first things I do in all of my classes, CWNA, when I taught ECSE classes, is um, we start looking at RF math. Now, math on a Monday or a Tuesday morning is, uh, is always exactly what the student wants. They're like, if I could only get more math first thing in the morning, especially when there's no coffee. <clears throat> so I thought I would uh, go through a bit of the math that, of course, we need to talk about the tens and the threes just for a second because there's bound to be somebody in the audience that when we say tens and threes, maybe they know a little bit about it but couldn't really articulate it. So we'll hit it real quick. But there are so many more things uh, in RF math, and we could spend days doing RF math. Not that I necessarily like math a lot, um, I do not. But uh, there's a lot of useful things that we can do here and that I want to go through. And, and, you know, I've got a bit of time here, so I'm not going to rush through it, uh, but uh, hope to leave a little bit of time at the end for questions. So math underpins everything in Wi-Fi. Um, you know, I'm sure some of you are going, oh, kill me, math. No, not math. But it's not so hard. Um, it's not, we don't have to know trigonometry or something like this, of course. But <clears throat> the first thing we're, we're going to uh, talk about is the fact that we have to use logarithms. Yes, logarithms. No formulas, fortunately. Just the concept of logarithms. So know that uh, we like to stay on the dB and dBm side of the math. Let's stay away from the milliwatts and let's stay away from the linear side of the math because the math can get really squirrely. You can have some really small numbers, 0. .0000000, who cares, right? And so uh, we don't like those kinds of numbers. So the relationship here um, uh, between the, the linear math uh, of, of milliwatts and then the dBm is, is logarithmic. And the reason for the logarithms or the logarithmic uh, scale is so that we can keep the math memorable. We can have a small number set in, that we can keep in our head rather than a large number set or a super small number set. When we're talking about uh, bottoming out at about 0.1 picowatts, because that's 0.000000, .000 and you get, you get the picture. <clears throat> Certainly we don't go too high on the high side. 100 milliwatts is a, a lot of power uh, in Wi-Fi. So we don't go too high on the high side, but it's the low side that, that causes us trouble. You only need to memorize three things in RF math to be able to do everything you need. The first is the reference point. This is, this is the point of conversion between the linear and the logarithmic. And so this reference point, we usually use 0 dBm equals a milliwatt. You can ac actually have, instead of uh, 0 dBm, you can have 0 dBw. And so that M stands for milliwatt. So 0 means none or no. And, of course, the dB is an amount of, of change in power, so no change. And then the M is milliwatt. So no change from a milliwatt is a milliwatt, right? So uh, zero dBm is a milliwatt, that's easy to remember. So you have to memorize that one, no way around it. So it's rare that we see anything up in the watt range, unless you're outdoors, point to point, but we deal mostly with indoor. <clears throat> so that's the first thing. And secondly is the, the rules of 10 and three. So if you're not familiar with tens and threes, uh, we have minus three dB, <clears throat> excuse me, minus three dB is, is a, amount of decrease in power of ha one half. And plus three dB doubles your power. And <clears throat> plus 10 dB is 10 times your linear power, your milliwatts, and minus is one tenth. So that's tens and threes. You have to memorize the tens, threes, and the, and the reference point. The rest of it kind of falls right in line. The rest of it's not so hard. But we're gonna give some examples here. I do this in class over and over, and it's, it's kind of surprising to me. We've been, uh, we've been teaching these classes since 2001, and even the old guard, folks that have been in it a long time, uh, they still haven't gone really further than the tens and threes. So when we start talking about two-way normalized free space path loss, they just kind of do that sideways head thing. Um, so you can see here examples of tens and threes, and logarithms keep this thing where we can, keep, we can keep it in our head and we don't have to use a calculator all the time. If you're going to a calculator, you're already wrong. So uh, <clears throat> moving on. So uh, math problems, if you stayed on the, on the linear side in, in the milliwatts, and I hear a lot of folks talking about milliwatts even this week, 
uh, in my class. It was milliwatts this and, and milliwatts that. I'm like, oh, we got to stop that. We got to stay in the DBM, stay with DB of change, DBI of gain for antennas and so on. Here's an example. Uh, 0.125 nanowatts, and it's not quite enough power, so we're going to need to bump that up 250 picowatts. So obviously you guys can all do that in your head very quickly. That's, that's 0. .00000, no thanks, right? It's a who cares. So again, why logarithm? We can keep it in our head. It's memorable. And so you can see, starting at the reference point, if we go negative, you know, like U.S. politics, we'll just go negative. And, and so uh, you start going minus 10, we're going from a milliwatt to 0.1 milliwatts, and then to 0.01 milliwatts, and then a microwatt, and so on and so on, until you get down into the uh, nanowatts and picowatts and sub-picowatts. If you related this all the way back to a milliwatt, it's a lot of zeros, more than most calculators can handle. And yet that's the power we're talking about with noise floors, with interference radiuses, with usable signal levels uh, and things like this. When you're getting down into the NEG 65, NEG, NEG 72, uh, 4 dB SNR uh, for detection, signal detect and things like this, we're way down in the NEG 90 range, NEG, NEG 92, NEG 94, something like this. So this is the kind of numbers you see. So I'm going to give you a math problem and, and, and then some options. The first, uh, first one is plus 27 dBm equals 500 milliwatts. But plus 27 dBm also equals 512 milliwatts. Would you agree? Right? We got some head nods. Yep. So it, it's, uh, it's both. It's both. So that brings up a question, right, immediately. Uh, so the options are one of them's correct, or both of them's correct, or both are incorrect. But I'm not going to give you the answer yet. So that's your options. Uh, you see that, you know, plus 27 can equal two things, or at least you suppose that, or, or does it? That's the big question, does it? I'm not going to give you the answer quite yet. First, let's talk about link variance. So there are a lot of... Uh, variables here. We First, we've got the transmitter. Secondly, we've got the receiver. And third, we have the channel. A channel you could define as a frequency space within a physical space. That is to say, if I had channel 36 in this root training room over here, it may act very differently than channel 36 in an industrial kitchen, just due to reflectivity, absorption, and other environmental factors. Does this make sense? Okay. So the channel, we'll start right in the middle. The channel has a variance of best case about plus or minus, that is plus or minus 3 dB. Remember that plus 3 dB is double and minus 3 dB is half. That is an enormous variance and that is your best case. If you've ever tried to measure wall loss or take any kind of reading, you'll see your reading doing this all the time. It's always bouncing. It's always variable. And, you're, and in some environments, it's a little more stable than others. So you go into a highly absorptive, uh, low reflectivity environment, it might be very stable and vice versa. Okay? So then on the, uh, the worst case scenario, the plus or minus 10, if you go into a highly reflective, highly changing environment, you would see that even if your transmitter and your receiver are very good, very stable themselves, you would see the channel is bouncing all over the place just because the environment is crazy. Um, that industrial kitchen is, is one of those environments that's pretty bad. So it's just lots of metal. So that's one variable. And then on the, left, on the left side here, we have the transmitter. Best case, again, about plus or minus 3 dB for variance. And these are uh, variants in like device. This is, this is not a variance across lots of different devices. This is like device, same device. And then worst case, about plus or minus 6. That is an enormous amount of variance on a transmitter. And then on the receiver, it's worse. And so plus or minus three to about plus or minus 12. And I'm going to show you some collected data um, in just a second. So when you add this, this variance up from transmitter through the channel and to the receiver, it gets to be almost ridiculous, even best case. So let's look at that. So we're going to use best case math here, the like device variance. That is two devices that are exactly the same on the transmit, on the receive. Not different manufacturers, different generations, the same exact device. 
So we take our, um, our plus or minus three, best case on the transmitter, best, uh, plus or minus three, best case on the channel, and plus or minus uh, 3 dB on the receiver. That, you think, oh no, this, this can't be good. So that's double or half, plus double or half, plus double or half. So what does that error look like uh, when you do the math? Now, most people think this is going to be, you know, times two, times two, times two, so 800%. Or divide by two, divide by two, divide by two, that's, uh, you know, minus 800%. You can't actually have a minus 800%. Minus 100% is zero, right? So, uh, so the variance looks like about a plus 700% down to about a minus 87.5, again, error margin, and it's the best case. And the worst cases, uh, going back, were pretty, pretty bad, you know, 6 and 10 and 12 uh, when it gets really bad. So a lot of your calculations are best effort, best case, guesswork. It's, it's a wet finger in air type of design. I got a lot of questions like that in my class this week. You know, you say neg 65, Devin, so uh, how do I know if I can't measure the noise floor and if my, uh, this transmitter, or I'm sorry, this receiver says the noise floor is this and this receiver says it's this and the spectrum analyzer says it's this, so which is it? Right, noise floor, eh, plus or minus something other. You know, it's some dBm value to somebody depending on where they are, how, how sensitive they are, how they do the measurement and so on. So if you have no noise floor, real, real ability to measure and concretely say what the noise floor is for everybody, then it's just ethereal. Anything based on that noise floor is ethereal, like, you know, signal to noise ratio. And we might care about signal to noise ratio just a little bit, right? It's one of the most important things we talk about. And yet measuring it is essentially impossible, and it is impossible across all the devices because like devices don't hear the same. Does that make sense? They're not the same sensitivity levels. So this is best case math right here, and it's pretty terrible. So what is the, the answer? Maybe it'll, the clicker will actually go to it in a second. There we go. So uh, the, did I get, yeah, there we go. The answer is both are correct. The 500 and the 512 are correct. Why is that? 2.4% differential between this. If you want to do that in your head, just double both of them. It's 1,000 and 1,024. So you got a, you've got 2.4% differential between these numbers. So they're so close when we're dealing with, you know, a best case of minus 87.5 to a plus 700%. Uh, of course, the worst case is just astronomical that we would say both of them are correct. Okay. So let's look at same device variance, this best case, plus or minus three. Um, you, you probably can't read the, um, the values there, but uh, we're seeing about plus or minus two to three on these uh, very, ex very expensive badges. These are industrial grade, commercial grade uh, gear. This is not uh, consumer grade gear. And you can look at that, uh, you can go uh, to um, a Blake site, the RSSI compared. I think Blake and Keith did some work on that. And, and uh, uh, that's a pretty nice site for looking at variants of devices. It's excellent. Okay, and here's some information that uh, Keith collected at his conference, and it shows variants of various types of devices, whether it's certain types of Apple devices or certain types of uh, Android devices, 2.4 or 5 or a mixture, and so on. And you can see here that it ranges from about plus or minus three to about plus or minus uh, 12 in variance on, on these devices. And some, in some of these, he measured same device. And so there's some pretty significant variance there. Okay, so let's talk about a few more math-related things that really do matter. First, free space path loss. At five gigahertz, then we've passed the, the variance and the tens and threes, and now let's talk about practical application. So free space path loss at five gigahertz is going to lose you minus 47 or 47 dB of loss in the first meter with an omni antenna in open space, okay? And then thereafter, every time you double the distance, you're gonna get another six dB loss. So if I'm at two meters, I'm gonna add six dB to 47, it's 53 dB of loss, and so on after that, every time you double the distance. This is because the free space path loss in open space and omni uh, calculation is one over distance squared. And so uh, if you do that math, you can see in the charts here, that's what you're gonna get for five gig. At 2.4 gig, it's 40 dB in the first one meter and 6 dB for every distance doubling thereafter. This is called the inverse square law. And we've given some references here as to whether you can, you can look this up. 
Again, the inverse square law, this is the formula, and this, this inverse square law can be um, retarded by uh, walls or any lost objects. It could be doors, could be humans, uh, anything like this. Uh, it could be changed, but this is an open space. You can see here that when we start putting your average wall, now there's no such thing as the average wall. How great would that be? I'm just going to calculate on an average wall. But when we start talking about a range of walls from, let's just say, um, a thin drywall up to modestly thick concrete, we're going to be modifying the exponent over distance. So it's 1 over distance squared in open space, but then it'll be somewhere between 1 over distance to the third to 1 over distance to the fourth as we are crossing boundaries. Every time we're doubling distance and we're having walls in the environment, that's how it's going to mess up the measurement. And how does that translate? Instead of uh, having another 6 dB of loss in open space for every distance doubling, it's going to give you uh, an extra 10 to 12 dB. If your exponent was 3, it'd be 10. If it was 4, it'd be 12, and so on. So in the average, you know, let's say uh, office space, walls, you know, hospital, school, if, unless it has some really weird areas, you could expect that outside that first meter, every time you double your distance, when you have walls in the environment, you could expect that that distance doubling is going to cost you 10 to 12 dB. And I usually play toward the 10. So just in my estimations, I don't do a lot of estimating this case, but uh, when I do, that's what I would do. Now let's talk about what's normal on the transmit, on the, ch on the, uh, uh, the channel, and on the receive. So we've got an entire range I'm showing here from lowest power, lowest transmit power up to the normal maximum power. Of course I know that some vendors can go higher than 26 dBm. That's a lot of power, but some vendors can go a little higher. That's okay, we, don't, we play right in the middle. I get a question all the time from students, how much power do I use on a five gig or a 2.4 gig radio? Um, I go from around uh, 10 to 14 EIRP, DBM, EIRP on 5 gig, and about uh, 6 to 10 on 2.4 EIRP, but um, I tend to turn off a lot of 2.4 radios. You probably already know that really well. So those are the two ranges that I start at. That's not to say that I finish there. That depends on wall loss, environment, wall density, not just loss of walls, how many walls in the environment, and so on. Then we have to account for free space path loss, of course, and that's the math we were just looking at, minus 47 or minus 40, depending on your band, and, and then another 6 dB, 6 dB, and so on after that in open space, or 10 to 12 dB for every distance doubling uh, in closed space, that is, space with loss objects in the environment. And then what is normal on the receive side? Well, it certainly depends on the client's sensitivity. That's a huge one. It's how well they can hear. It also depends on the distance, and it depends on the output power uh, of the access points. So there's a lot of variables. But what's normal? What's the average? What's kind of the, you know, the expected? And so we would see in most rooms, unless the room is super big, unless we're using way too much power or way too little power, et cetera, we're going to see in most rooms, most average classrooms, training rooms, uh, office rooms, and things like this, about neg 35 to neg 55. And I just put some numbers in there to give you a ballpark. If you saw neg 56, you should not freak out, right? And so that's, that's what I would expect in room from the average client, computing devices, phones, tablets, laptops, etc., computing devices. Then uh, from there, when we go outside of a room or, you know, at a further distance, and then, of course walls simulate distance so due to loss, we're going to about neg 65 to neg 67 uh, on the receive, and I get a question all the time, what, what makes those numbers special? Neg 65 is based on an estimated noise floor of Neg 90, giving us a 25 dB SNR, and that's enough to achieve MCS 7, which is the maximum MCS rate for 11N. How's that? So, um, so we're, that's what we're aiming toward. We might get less, we might get more, we might have interference, raised noise floor, there's all kinds of variables, but it's a starting point. Next, as the signal drops, and of course your SNR drops, your modulation drops, data rates drop, and they keep dropping and falling out until they're no longer detectable. So we would call somewhere in the next 68 to next 72 as a data grade. This is your generic terms. These are you know, values that are ballpark just based on a, a perceived neg 90 noise floor. And then they're going to degrade until you can't detect them, and that's usually around 4 dB SNR, 
but that's on a per client basis. The better the client can hear, the further that is uh, from the transmitter. So let's look at this graphically. So you got your access point on the left, it's on five gigahertz, and the values are loss values in dB. So these are change values, loss values, not actual signal levels. And these distances, distances are calculated in meters. So in that first meter, we lose minus 47. Then another uh, meter is doubling the distance, and we lose another six, so now we're down to minus 53 dB of loss. Going on to four meters, minus 59, then 65 at eight meters, and so on. You can see that. Okay, so let's take, let's just do a small example here. If we had an eight meter radius room, that is you get in the center, you walk to the corners and it's eight meters. That's eight really big steps for a pretty tall person. And the AP was at plus 10 dBm of power. Then we use this loss in dB value. We would say if it's on five gig, it's at plus 10 dBm ERP, then we could expect to see plus 10 at the starting point, then minus 47 on the first meter, and then minus six, minus six, minus six for two, four, and eight meters. And we should end up at minus 55 dBm RSSI, one way normalized free space path loss. What does that mean? It means that it's one way math. It means that we simply did the calculation in open space with an omni antenna. Could these values be different? Yes, your, your antenna may be down tilted. You may have a directional antenna. Um, so these, things, these values can be changed by a lot of, a lot of things. We'll talk about, about two way in just a second. So this is how this math plays out, okay? So the one way is simply you've got a transmitter and it is propagating in, in a, in a um, omni pattern <clears throat> and we're doing the uh, free space path loss formula. That's it. That is not the real world. It is the starting point. Okay. Now, so how does this look when we put it into, let's say, a modeling software? So we put the um, the AP in, and we, we simply watch the calculation happen, right? It colors it in. It says that we have here NEG65, NEG66, NEG67, and so on. It's propagating, and it's simply doing free space path loss math. If you stop here on your models and your surveys, you're wrong. Uh, your math will be wrong and sometimes really wrong. So especially on the survey side of things, this is one-way math. We have to add back in um, the client device and I like to call it the least capable, most important, LCMI. Your, your customer may have uh, 10 devices that they really care about, and you can only design for a single device anyway, and so it's gonna be that least capable that you're gonna design for. And then you could validate 10 or 12 or what have you on the back end of the process in the life cycle. So here, what do we have? We got an access point, and you can see it's zero meters, he's got zero dBm. So we're just making this math very, very simple. <clears throat> at at uh, one meter, we've lost minus 47. So we're, since we're starting out at the you know, zero dBm ERP, which is, is theoretical, of course, it, no, no AP is gonna put out that low power ERP. Uh, just to make the math easy, we go to two meters, to four meters, to eight meters, and we're down to uh, a normally a neg 65 dBm, just with the one-way math, but, We've got to calculate back in the sensitivity of our client device. The client device in this case is a 2 by 2 11 AC. That's a really good uh, radio. And let's say that due to its sensitivity, it's going to add back in another 10 uh, dB um, of gain. And so now what was neg 65 is neg 55. If we had a much worse receiver, let's just say it's an old 11A, or it could be a one by one 11N, small antenna, terrible quality radio, it may mimic the free space path loss. And so we may actually have NEG65 with that device, just simply because it's not very good. Does that make sense? So we like to call, call this the LCMI. Now when we're modeling, we're modeling for two-way uh, normalization here on the LCMI device, so we have to put that 10 dB back into our model. Whether the worst device, this least capable, most important device, is uh, below the free space path loss, that is below the one-way normalized math, or it's above it, it's better or worse than, whatever it is, we're going to put it back into our model and that's gonna change the model. We have to do the same thing on the back end. When we survey, we're going to get all of our values, all the collected uh, values of signal strength based on the receiver sensitivity 
of the NICs that are doing the listening. And so our client devices, our, our customers' actual devices may be far worse in quality than our NICs for surveying. In fact, uh, uh, one customer recently, the difference between the LCMI and my survey NICs was 18 dB. So we did some surveying. Everything was nice and green, as you can imagine. And so uh, the customer saw it and went, wow, our environment's fantastic. And then I just slid everything over 18 dB. And I said, not to that device, it's not. It's really terrible. And of course, the customer's like, wait a minute. If we need to add even more signal strength to make this old crappy device work, what does that do to our good devices? Ooh, bad. Co-channel interference, because the better they can hear. If you're basing your whole design off the low end, your mid and high end are going to hear too much. They're going to experience co-channel interference, therefore capacity loss. And they're your higher end devices. Those are the ones you want to go faster. But if you design higher in the stack, you go to the mid-range two by two devices, then the low end devices may have roaming problems, coverage problems, and such as that. So how do we put this back into our model, this, this offset math, this LCMI offset, as I like to call it? We're going to go into uh, our software, no matter whose software you're using, and you're going to put in um, this offset value into a device profile. You're going to say that I've got a such and such widget, a, uh, an iPhone, an Android phone, whatever it is, you're going to have a profile for it, and you're going to put this offset, whether pl positive or negative. And once you put that in there, you've got to apply it. So you can see in the left graphic here, this is purely one-way one normalized free space path loss. But then once we apply this, um, you can see that the coverage shrinks. I applied a, a, a minus 5 dB value, and you can see that the coverage for that AP shrinks as perceived by that particular client profile, device profile. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Okay. Oops, sorry, go back. Thank you. Um, uh, I've got uh, just a, a few minutes for questions. Um, this usually draws a lot of questions uh, when you start uh, tinkering with the math of your, your models and your surveys and things like this. So is it okay to take a couple of questions? Okay, yep. Might have to, have to help me out here. I can't see anything. Raise your hand if you have any questions. Wow, there's no way that, oh, oh okay. there we go. Just like, a matter of nobody time. Nobody had questions, that'd be awesome. Green is good, right? Wait. You showed on there that you were talking about your lowest common uh, or lowest LCMI. Yeah. LCMI. How did you come up with those numbers uh, to suggest what they would be? What they yes, would that's a great question. So there are um, two ways, two processes we have to use. There's one on the front end, one on the back end, one for modeling, one for surveying. They're completely different. The offset for a model is against free space path loss. Okay, so um, how I do this is I will go into my model and uh, I may or may not put walls in. It depends on if I have open space on, you know, on-prem or not. Um, what I'm looking for is, is what the model does free space path loss math. Okay, that's, that's a given. We put the AP in the modeling software and it shows me X. It shows me some pattern. And so what I'm going to do is take what I believe to be the least capable, yet still most important. It's on my top 10 most important list. I'll take that device, and I'm going to go to where the model says that it's supposed to be next 65 or next 70, whatever it is, the value. I'm going to go to that, that spot, and I'm going to measure. I'm going to turn on a scanner, and I'm going to measure. And whatever I get... Uh, may or may not be the same as the model says is supposed to be here. Neg 65 is supposed to be right here, says the model. And I'm going to go, nope, I got neg 70. And if I have, and I, usually I'm going to spin the device around. I'm going to, because you'll have different coverage as you rotate various devices or move them and orient them. And I'm going to try to find uh, the low end, that is the worst possible scenario. And then that differential is going to be what I put into the software. Now, on the back end, uh, it's, it, you're not measuring against free space path loss. You're measuring against your survey adapters. They're the reference. So you survey, 
um, and then uh, you're going to go find that device. And then the, the differential is quite easy. Turn on an access point anywhere. Just turn one on on 5 gig. It could be in the same room or not. And see what your, the scanner in, in the survey software says it is in signal strength and see what the scanner on the device says it is. And if there's a 10 dB differential, plug it in. It's as simple as that. But you have to do it against free space path loss on the design and in the model. You have to do it against your survey adapters on the back end. Does that make sense? Okay. Any others? Wow. Okay, I got done early. Awesome. I'll give you back your 10 minutes.